Hello and welcome to this session where we'll be reviewing the ClassView Connect component of the Autoscholar Advisor system. So on entering ClassView Connect, you will want to log in first. So you click up here and you enter your user ID and password. Your user ID typically being uh, the string before the at in your email address. So enter that and uh, we should load up to this uh, default course. And in this uh, presentation, I'm going to be showing results with anonymization turned on. So don't be surprised when you see this garbled text. So when you log in and enter it, you'll see a student name. So that will be a first name and a last name and a student number. So um, at the moment with anonymization turned on, we are of course protecting the identity of the students here. So this is the first interface that will load up. This is showing us uh, the course code uh, that uh, we are uh, of the course we are reviewing and the year of the records that we'll also be reviewing. And the first little box up here shows us the total number of students in this course in this year. It's showing us the number of high performing students and we'll show what we mean by high performing just now. And uh, we have 31 at-risk students here. Also, we'll show uh, how that's calculated. We can also see some information about the assessments in this course. So here, we luckily have no students uh, having a mark below 50% on this assessment. And the mean mark uh, in this assessment, that's 69%, uh, and that's a standard deviation. And we'll talk a bit more about what those parameters mean just now. Then looking further, we can see below here, um, we have some property statistics. So this is showing us of the assessments in this course, uh, some of the basic statistics there. And then we've got a list of students here. So we can see our high performing students here. And by the way, when you see lists like this, it's typically restricted to uh, 10 entries. So you might need to use the pager to view the other entries. You also have a little search uh, uh, field here. So if you start typing the first few characters of uh, uh, of whatever it is uh, being shown here, it, it will uh, limit the list there. So uh, we can see the high performing students here. Uh, we can see at risk here, all the students and so on. So that's uh, the list of students. And then as we click around on this list, we can see a message being populated on the right here. So these are the high performing students. So the message is saying, I'm pleased to note the progress you're making and so on. If you go to the risk students, uh, you can see a different method, uh, just uh, advising the student to engage with the support methods and so on. And if you click on send message, then that's going to create a message that we can customize and then send to the student. So that's how we can advise students who are found to be at risk and so on. So let's look at the method of calculating the risk. So here on the left, we can see uh, the, the two assessments that have been written in this class so far. And we calculate the mean mark, right? So the blue dots are the results by actual students. And in fact, uh, what's on uh, the y-axis here is the frequency. So the actual mark is down here, and we can see marks uh, 60, 70, 80. And so these are all the, uh, uh, this is the range of the marks by all the students in this class. Now, what uh, we, uh, uh, the way that we construct these frequency plots is by counting up the number of students with a mark in a certain range. So for instance, if we count up uh, all the marks between 60 and 65%, so if we add up all the students who have marks in that range, and let's say we have something like 10 students, then the frequency of students uh, with that uh, is calculated by taking 10 divided by the total number, so that's 100, and then uh, we uh, divide also by the range of marks there. So the frequency is not the fraction. The frequency is a number that you can use to infer the fraction. 
but um, let's not let that trip us up. We can also view this uh, these blue dots and uh, view them against the orange dots, which are an ideal bell curve, right? So orange is showing us an ideal bell curve, and we can look at how closely these blue dots resemble a bell curve. So a bell curve is uh, the normal distribution. And if you read about normal distributions, that fits many types of populations and so on. And uh, in this case, in it's found that most of the time, student results fit a bell curve. So looking at this bell curve, we can see here, yes, the, do, uh, the blue dots uh, do somewhat fit around uh, this bell curve. And the two parameters that dictate uh, the shape of the bell curve, that's the mean. So that tells us, uh, we, we know that's the mean mark, but in a bell curve, that's going to be the central point. So we can see the peak here sitting around 69%. And then the standard deviation relates to the width of that bell curve. So this uh, number does have units. So if, for instance, the X value is the mark, then this is a standard deviation of 5.4 marks, right? So that tells us approximately how wide uh, the curve is. And of course, um, the width varies as you look at different points here. But a standard deviation is the uh, value uh, within which we fit approximately 69% uh, of the students or 68% of our population. So if our distribution is describing the frequency at which students are getting marks in specific ranges, we can say within a one standard deviation uh, range, we have um, about 68% of all our students. So the average student is between minus one and plus one standard deviation. So they are somewhere in this range of marks. And if a student has a standard deviation, if their result, let's say we look at this blue dot right on the right side here, this blue dot is more than one standard deviation above the mean. So that's an unusually high mark. And by the same token, uh, blue dots down here are unusually low marks. So any students uh, with marks in this range have performed unusually poorly. And that's the basis for uh, determining whether the student is high performing or at risk, right? We look at the mark by the student. So let's expand this student. We can see here uh, the result is 75%. And if you look at TM1, right, TM1, the mean mark is 69%. Uh, uh, and the standard deviation is 5 so this mark of 75 is just slightly above the standard deviation of one. So that means this student has performed slightly above the average uh, student here. And if we look at a few more of these, okay, that's also 75. Um, so, uh, well, uh, here's 80. So, and in this case, the student has performed uh, above the mean in both uh, test one and test two. So it's saying here high uh, test one mark, high test two mark. So that's how we determine these students as being high performing. And the risk students, of course, are falling on the other side of that. So here we have uh, a mark that's more than one standard deviation below the mean. So that's um, how we distinguish between high performing and low performing. And if we look uh, at all, then you can page through all the students uh, in this class. And of course we can view all test results. So if we click on TM2, then we can see the stats for uh, that assessment as well. So this gives us a way to quickly identify the high performing students and high-performing students do also need to be encouraged to maintain that position. So let's say there were more assessments coming up and, of course, an exam, then uh, you'd also want to advise these students to keep doing well there. And that's what this message is uh, is doing there. Under at risk, you can, uh, you'll get a different type of message. And here we are encouraging uh, support methods. We can customize the script. So here under message script editor, you can view the code that's used to generate the message. 
And it's a little bit hard to see on this uh, uh, in this form, but if we try to read this, we can see uh, there's an E object. So that refers to the entity, namely the student. And uh, the system has classified that student as being of type two. So type two students are high performing students here. And type one is an average uh, where, where the results are in the average range. And uh, uh, type zero is where uh, the student needs more support. There's a little spelling mistake here. Um, so you can, um, you can customize this message. You can change the script and uh, you can change the, uh, the variables that are used to generate the message here. So you can see if statements and you can see a message being generated here. Um, and if you look down here under metadata, uh, you can see some information about the student. And in fact, uh, we'll supplement this uh, by the time you read this, uh, probably uh, there are more uh, fields that you can uh, use to really customize a message here. So uh, that's your uh, message script editor. So you can uh, just uh, edit this message. You can edit the code and click update messaging script, and then it will change the nature of the, um, of the messages being sent to the students. And if you, we use it in this mode, send a message, then we can, um, we can edit each of the messages before sending them out. And so when we click send message, then it brings up the email for us and we can customize before sending it off. Um, so that's one. Uh, for automated messaging, number one, you can edit which students are receiving these automated messages. So uh, remember, this is all garbled for anonymization reasons, but you can go ahead and edit this list down. So when you enter this, you'll be able to see um, what the list actually involves there. And then continuing with this, um, once we've edited down this list and we've chosen the students who should get this automated message, then we can click on send to all. So at your institution, if an auto scholar email address has been implemented, then when you click on this, this will send uh, that message to each of the students. So the, the message will be different uh, depending on the student's uh, uh, position. And uh, of course, uh, besides that, just the name of the student and so on uh, will change here. You can also add your uh, name and so on. So in the script editor, uh, here uh, we can add a name, for example. So. You can edit this and then you can send it out to all the students. Okay, and of course, uh, we always want to preview and check that the right message is being sent to the right student. So uh, don't assume that your change here uh, has worked. If there's a, a bug in the code or something, you want to check that by uh, going here. And check back in this section. Uh, number one, as mentioned, the metadata uh, will be increased. And also we'll be adding more templates uh, for us to apply different types of messages to students. Okay, so that's messaging. And then just coming back here, uh, we've talked about high performing at-risk students um, and all students. So you can browse the student results. And if you click on view all results, you can see how that student is doing. But if you go to download as well, uh, you can go ahead and download all the student results and the advice and so on uh, to a CSV or an Excel document and so on. So you can download all the records and you can separately download high performing, low performing and, uh, and all students. Uh, furthermore, we can also customize the risk settings. So we've, uh, we've seen that uh, the risk is calculated based on uh, the relative position using the number of standard deviations. And that's a slightly simplified view. Um, so the way uh, this works is that we raise an alert if a result is unusually high or unusually low in a particular assessment. And, uh, and so based on that, uh, we add an alert. And the alert might be positive or negative. So if it's a high result, then it's a positive alert. If it's a low result, it's negative. 
And there are other uh, things besides standard deviations we can apply. So if we also want to test if, um, if the mark is in a certain range. So if we want to check whether uh, the, the student has a mark above a certain value, then you can adjust that value here. And uh, we can also uh, check, uh, so if a result is above a certain value, so let's say uh, a mark is over 80%, but let's say that 80% is, uh, let's say it's a test that has a very high average. And, uh, and let's say the mean mark is even 90%, um, but the student has 80%. So normally, um, you would probably uh, raise an alert on that 80%. But if we uh, say here, omit the alert if the mark is, a, is above a certain level. So we might say, well, it, it would be ridiculous to raise an alert uh, on a mark that's more than 80%. So you can set uh, that threshold here. You can say override. Uh, so even if the student's uh, standard deviation even if the student is um, less than minus one standard deviations uh, below the mean, if the mark is still over 80%, then uh, don't raise an alert. So you can do that there. Then also uh, this value of one is something of an arbitrary choice, right? We are saying uh, raise alerts on students above um, one standard deviation as a positive alert and raise alerts uh, as a negative thing on students uh, less than a standard deviation below the mean. So the value of one standard deviation is arbitrary. We can change this. So for example, to 0 0.5 and so on. And uh, sometimes also uh, the zeros on, uh, on a sheet, uh, on a mark sheet, uh, the zeros sometimes indicate uh, absence so it's not normally the case. Most of the time there's a special code if someone is absent from a test. But in the case where we don't want to include a zero because we think that zero is an error or something, then you can switch this to no and say don't include zeros. So those are some of the things we can customize here. So we've got the two assessments and uh, we can independently change this. So we might know, for instance, 50% uh, on test two um, is too low a mark to check, and we can change that here. So we can customize uh, the alert raising uh, criteria here, and then we just click update risk settings. So just changing uh, the setting here and then closing this uh, won't do anything. Uh, we can customize the values, and then we must click update risk settings. And then uh, the, uh, the whole calculation here will change and you'll find the messages up there will change as well. Um, so that's how you can customize your risk settings. And I forgot to mention uh, here, if you click on these buttons, you'll see it, uh, it quick jumps you to that place. So if we want to see all students, we just click here. That takes us there. Or we could click on, on this thing here. If we click high performing students, it takes us there, risk students there. If we wanted to jump to test one, um, you can see it goes to test one there. Test two brings up test two there. So those are some quick links. All right, so this section helps us identify the students at risk and send them uh, uh, messages aimed at improving uh, the situation. And then down here um, are some notes about things that could be done to improve the course. And so in this case, uh, this advising uh, method has not been used as yet. So it's saying uh, to the teacher, uh, please go ahead and, and use the messenger to, uh, to advise the students. The concept scaffold hasn't been implemented and we'll uh, see just now where that is and what we can do and learning resources that relates to that. Your assessment schedule, we'll see under metadata, you can uh, change that and so on. So um, so that's uh, some advice to the lecturer about things that uh, could be done to organize the course so that uh, we can support the, uh, a better performance uh, in the class. Then we might want to review the student records in a bit more detail. So we've seen uh, some information uh, within this course, but let's say we want to know how the student is doing overall as well. So under student records, um, if we just click on load, so first um, we want to specify uh, the course code here 
because we want to see of all students registered in this course in this year, what else are they doing? So if we click on load, then uh, let's look at the student. So it's saying to the student, um, you are currently on track to graduate with an upper second uh, class of degree. And that's because your credit weighted average is at this value. If you can raise your average to 81% in the remaining credits, so lots of remaining credits in this program. And if you can raise your, uh, your credit weighted average, uh, then you can graduate with a lower first instead. Right. And by the way, if this was a lower first year, then it would be looking for an upper first and so on. So uh, it's giving the student some average things to shoot for. And then it's also giving the student more specific advice here. So it's looking at the student and it's figuring out, well, you've got these results in the tests here so far. So for us to stay on track uh, to get this credit weighted average of 81 something percent, uh, the student needs to maintain this higher mark, right? You can see uh, the student has underperformed to some extent in uh, in these assessments. So for that student to reach this upper first um, or lower first um, and uh, get to that credit weighted average, they should be pushing towards uh, this high mark uh, in the remaining assessments. And of course, this is not the only opportunity to get there. But um, if you want to stay exactly on that, uh, uh, if you want to reach that target, this course, uh, the student does need to perform better on. And here as well, uh, the student has performed better in these assessments in this other class that they are currently registered for. So uh, the requirement here is a bit lower. So uh, it's giving the student specific targets and uh, it helps the student prioritize um, uh, where to direct the study efforts and so on. And here under improve my results, um, that can direct the student to uh, academic support and also other um, uh, the learning pathways and so on that we'll look at uh, just now. Uh, so that's uh, Sumeric advice in the current semester. But if we look under academic records, then you can also review what that student has been doing uh, over time as well. So this student uh, was registered for uh, this academic program um, uh, previously in those years and semesters. If we click on any one of those years, it shows us what the student was doing in those years. And if you click on that course code, it shows the records. So the student seems to have missed a couple of assessments. And um, yeah, so you can basically review the complete academic records uh, for the student there. So that's what's under student records. Then we can also review uh, the performance by uh, this course uh, in the previous years. If we click on load historical performance, so we can see here uh, the pass rate has been changing in this way and the mean. So this course is fairly stable, especially in recent times. Um, and we can also see the numbers for that here. By the way, I forgot to mention earlier, the skewness refers to, <laughs> just on cue, it went skew over there, but uh, the skewness refers to, um, if we look at uh, our distribution, it tells us uh, how far shifted to the left or right. Uh, so how skewed is our data compared with the normal distribution? And the other thing is, uh, the kurtosis. So kurtosis tells us um, instead of uh, a bell curve, how sharp and pointy or how short and flat uh, is uh, the data compared with the bell curve. So that's uh, what we get under course performance. So we can look at the historical performance of the, of the class. If we click on load peer performance, um, that's going to tell us how the course stacks up against the other courses that the same students are taking. So it looks at all the students that are registered in this course, and it looks at the other courses that they are also taking in a similar semester. So it's finding here that the level of correlation between uh, this course and these others is highest here. 
So there may be some good correlation. There might, might be some conceptual reason for this course correlating against this one. And we also read these numbers to get a sense for whether there's some kind of consistency um, in terms of performance. So if we see very low numbers in a particular course, that tells us that the students who are doing well in this course, are uh, it's not so related to how they do in other courses. And uh, if we think there, uh, there should be some correlation when there isn't, then that may indicate that there are non-academic reasons at play. And, uh, and so that helps us figure out what to do to support uh, better performance in the course, right? So that helps us uh, get some insight there. And then if we want to view uh, 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 more graphically, if we want to view this more graphically, we select two courses here. So uh, let's leave the current course here and then let's change to, for instance, this one. And here, we can see quite a scatter, right? So basically we are plotting the one course's results here and the other course's results there. And um, if the, there is a perfect correlation between the two courses, then the blue dots would all sit on, this, on the orange dots here. But there isn't, right? Because if you look at these two courses, you can see there is a very low correlation between the two of them. So we can see a, a wide scatter around each of the orange dots there. The slightly better one is here, 426 is PBA. So let's look at PBA. And with PBA, you can see uh, somewhat uh, more of a correlation. If we look at one of the higher ones, um, yeah, we, well, we don't really have any very high correlations in this data. Um, well, let's look here, FNA. So FNA with MKA, so MKA, and oop, we haven't included FNA here, but we should see a, a better correlation between those two classes. So uh, that's uh, uh, so this number is the Pearson R uh, coefficient. Uh, you can get negative correlations. So if there is a correlation, but there's an inverse correlation, then it will show up as a negative value. A value of one means it's a uh, perfect correlation. So here, if we correlate the same course against its own values, then we'll, we will get the perfect correlation. Um, but uh, um, that's, uh, that's not of interest to us. We, it's pointless correlating the same values against themselves. Um, so uh, that's the Pearson R coefficient. Then um, if we come here under learning pathways, um, you can define the concept scaffold and uh, you can define uh, how the concepts in the class are related to each other. And so there's a separate video on this topic. So if you look uh, under the Autoscholar playlist, you'll find a full explanation for creating concept scaffolds and uh, uh, defining learning pathways and, and so on. So um, you can use this to create uh, resources that your students can use uh, to study uh, any topic, right? So uh, if a student is underperforming, uh, in essence, they can use this to, um, to figure out a learning pathway and progress their studies that way. So there's that. And then under uh, course metadata, remember uh, under course status, there were a couple of warnings about not defining the assessment schedule or the metadata and the concept scaffold and the learning resources. So these ones uh, we've talked about. So under learning pathways, you can address these issues. And then for your assessment schedule and assessment metadata, you would uh, go on over to the metadata section. So of course, metadata. And number one, for defining your assessment weights and um, yeah, your assessment weights, uh, you click on the search icon and that will bring up the assessments. And if you uh, select an assessment and click on the little edit icon here, it will show you um, what assessment this is and what weight uh, that is counting towards the final. Uh, so you can also define the start and end dates uh, for this assessment. Um, and uh, yeah, the weight, how much the assessment counts towards the final is there. So you can define that there. 
so that's one. And then you can also set your class events here. So your lectures and so on, um, you can uh, create. Uh, so for instance, if I click on this, then it brings up this event. It shows me the start and end times, and there's a pin here. So during the event, you announce to the students what the pin is, and then they would go on Archer Scholar Student Central, enter the pin, and that would register them as present. So you can not just uh, set your um, your events here, you can also uh, monitor attendance and registration. So all you need to do here, you can set recurring events. You create your events, uh, you uh, populate the calendar for the course, and then at the event, just check uh, the pin for that event uh, just by clicking on the event, and then it will give you the pin here and you announce the PIN to the class, and then the class will go and enter the PIN uh, like on their cell phone or something, and uh, that will register them as present. So uh, that's basically it. Uh, I hope you find these uh, methods useful in improving the performance in your class. Thanks for listening.